Jonathan Harker's Journal. 3rd May, Bistritz. Left Munich at 8.35 p.m. on 1st May. Arriving at Vienna early next morning, should have arrived at 6.46, but the train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse which I got of it from the train, and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station, so we had arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east. The most western of splendid bridges over the Danube, which is here of noble width and depth, took us among the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time and came after nightfall to Klausenberg. Here I stopped for the night at the Royal Hotel. I had for dinner all rather Supper, a chicken done up some way with red pepper, which was very good, but thirsty. A memorandum, get recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called paprika hendel, and that, as it was a national dish, I should be able to get it anywhere along the Carpathians. <laughs> I found my smattering of German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having had some time at my disposal when in London, I had visited the British Museum and made search among the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance when dealing with a nobleman of that country. I find that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia and Bukovnia, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I did not sleep well. Though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it. Or it may have been the paprika, for I, I had to drink up all the water in my carrot and was still thirsty. On the dark side of twilight, when we got to Bistritz, it was an interesting old place, being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads from it to Bukovnia. It has a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost 13,000 people, the casualties of war proper being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel which I found, to my great delight, to be thoroughly old-fashioned. For of course I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door, I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress, white undergarment with a long double apron. When I came close, she bowed and said, the Herr Englishman? <laughs> yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white shirt sleeves who had followed her to the door. He went but immediately returned with a letter. 
my friends. Welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, the diligence will start for Bukovnia. A place on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. Fourth May. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me. But on making inquiries as to details, he seemed somewhat reticent and pretended he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly. At least, he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who had received me, looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter and that was all he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula and could tell me anything of his castle, both he and his wife crossed themselves, saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refused to speak further. It was so near time of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else for it was all very mysterious and not by any means comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip on what German she knew and mixed it all up with some other language, which I did not know at all. I was just able to follow her by asking many questions when I told her that I must go at once and that I was engaged on important business she asked again do you know what day it is I answered that it was 4th of May she shook her head and she said again oh, yes I know that I know that but do you know what day it is on my saying that I did not understand she went on it is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going and what you are going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally, she went down on her knees and implored me not to go, at least to wait a day or two before starting. <laughs> <laughs> it was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could not allow anything to interfere with it. I tried to raise her up and said, as gravely as I could, that I thanked her, that my duty was imperative and that I must go. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put her rosary around my neck and said, for your mother's sake, and went out of the room. I am writing this part of the diary whilst waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still round my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear, or the many ghostly traditions of this place, or the crucifix itself, I do not know. But I am not feeling nearly as easy in mind as usual. If this book should ever reach Mina before I do, let it bring my goodbye. Here comes my coach.
5th May, the castle. The grey of morning had passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jagged, whether with trees or hills, I know not. But it is so far off that big things and little are mixed. I am not sleepy, and as I am not to be called till I awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat, and I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears and the beauty of the scene as we drove along. Before us lay a green sloping land for the forests and woods, with here and there steep hills crowned with clumps of trees, with farmhouses, the blank gable end to the road. They were everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom. <laughs> Apple, plum, pear, cherry. <laughs> and as we drove by, I could see the green grass under the trees spangled with the fallen petals. In and out amongst these green hills, what they call here the middle land, ran the road losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve, or shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods, which here and there ran down the hillside like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but we seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand then what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time. One of my companions touched my arm as we slept round the base of a hill and opened up the lofty, snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look! It's the set! God seat, and he crossed himself reverently. As we wound on our endless ways, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us. The shadows of evening began to creep round us. And then, through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs, and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level, and as we appeared to be flying along, the mountain seemed to come nearer to us on each side, and to frown down upon us as we were entering on the Borgo Pass. The blackness. All was dark. The only light was the flickering lays of our own lamps, in which the steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could see now the sandy road lying white before us. But there was on it no sign of a vehicle. When the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something which I could hardly hear, spoken so quietly and in so low a tone. I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then turning to me, he spoke in German worse than my own. There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovnia and return tomorrow or the next day. Better the next day. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh, snort, and plunge wildly, so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, there was the chorus of screams from the peasants, and a universal crossing of themselves. Kalish, the four horses, drove up behind us, 
overtook us and drew up beside the coach. I see in the flash of our lamps as the rays fell on them, the horses were coal black and splendid animals. And they were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat which seemed to hide his face from us. I could see only the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes which seemed red in the lamplight. As he turned to us, he said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend. The man stammered in reply. The English heir was in a hurry, to which the stranger replied, That is why, I suppose, you wished him to go to Bukovnia. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift. As he smoked, he smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips sharp looking teeth as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to the other a line from the burghers of Lenore. Denn die Toten reiten schnell. For the death travel fast. By and by, however, so I was curious to know how time was passing. I struck a match. While its flame looked at my watch, it was within a few minutes of midnight. This gave me some sort of shock, for I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse down the road. A long, agonised wailing, as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, to borne on the wind, which was now sighed softly through the pass. A wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country, as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. At the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear, but the driver spoke to them soothingly and they quieted down. Shivered and sweated as though after a runaway from sudden fright. Then, far off in the distance, from the mountains on each side of us, began a loud and sharper howling, that of wolves. The driver suddenly turned down a narrow roadway, which ran sharply to the right. Soon we were hemmed in with trees, which in places arched over the roadway, till we passed as through a tunnel. And again, great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in shelter, we could hear the wind rising, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches on the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine, powdery snow began to fall. But soon we, and all around us, were covered with a white blanket. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, though this grew fainter as we went on our way. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing round on us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, but I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He had once checked the horses and, jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do. 
the less as the howling of the wolves grew closer. But while I wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again, <laughs> and without a word took his seat, and we resumed our journey. have fallen asleep and kept dreaming of the incident, for it seemed to be repeated endlessly. And now, looking back, it was like a sort of awful nightmare. Then, for a time there were no blue flames, and we sped onwards through the gloom with the howling of the wolves around us, as though we were following in a moving circle. At last, there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had gone yet. And during his absence, the horses began to tremble worse than ever, and to snort, scream with fright. I could not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether. Just then, the moon, sailing through the black clouds, appeared behind the jagged crest of a beaten pine clad rock. And by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves, white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long, sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible than the grim silence which had held them, even when they had All at once, the wolves began to howl, as though the moonlight had made some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared, and looked hopelessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see. But the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had to perforce to remain within it. I called out to the coachman to come. For it seemed to me that our only chance was to try and break out through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the cunnish, hoping by the noise to scare the wolves from the side, so as to give him a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there I know not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound saw him stand in the roadway as he swept his long arms as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle the walls fell back and back further still just then a heavy cloud passed over the face of the moon and we were in darkness again When I could see the driver was climbing into Kalish, and the wolves disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed into minimal as we swept our way, now in almost complete darkness. Suddenly, I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast, ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the sky. Count Dracula's castle. <laughs> 